Hi everyone, today let's talk about the news. First up, let's talk about Jerome. Of course, he released his thoughts on the economy as well as his thoughts on future interest rates and apparently he's optimistic, but only if Congress does more now. I'm not sure they can do any more right now since they've already spent over $3 trillion, but I guess we'll find out. Next up, it's like the wild, wild west out here with the get rich quick versus the Wall Street pros. Apparently, there's some speculation that retail investors are what's driving up the market. I'm not really sure how statistically that's possible if they only own about 20% of the overall market, while Wall Street pros and hedge funds own about 80%. And lastly, Disneyland talks about reopening, but people are concerned. They're signing petitions telling them that they should wait. I'm not sure it's really valuable for them to open at this point. It seems like customer confidence is not going to be there for quite a while, but I'm sure they are starving for cash. As always, there will be some jelly at the end, which is something I enjoyed outside of the markets. If you have big dreams like buying this modern villa right in the heart of Hurricane Alley, or if you're just getting started on your financial journey, go ahead and like and subscribe. It has a wonderful back deck with a built-in grill a beautiful and modern kitchen, a spacious and luxurious master bedroom, a beautiful master bathroom and master closet. This house does come with some tough choices though, like should I swim in my pool or should I swim in the ocean? Decisions, decisions to keep your dreams at the front of your mind. Like and subscribe. Welcome to the Portfolio Bulletin. Let's get started. All right, first up, Jay Powell keeper of the monetary policy. So Jerome said that he is optimistic for the long-term growth of the U.S. economy. He said that America's monetary policy makers all believe that the long run looks exactly the same as it did in December, despite everything that's happened over the past six months. He continues to believe that the cough situation is not going to leave a permanent mark on the U.S. economy. However, he predicates this all with Congress's willingness to do more. He goes on to talk about how underlying businesses were doing perfectly well, and he believes Congress will probably need to go further. So Congress at this point, since the cough situation started, has spent $3 trillion in the CARES Act, plus another $2 trillion in normal spending, which means they've spent nearly a quarter of the entire GDP of the United States in less than a fiscal quarter. Is that enough? Honestly, I think that it is. I mean, a lot of people that are on unemployment are currently receiving $1,000 a month, at least through the end of July, which means they have another month and a half until that benefit runs out. Plus, a lot of businesses got payment protection plans, which they have to keep employment on to receive the forgiveness for those loans. They basically paid for an entire quarter of GDP. Is that not enough? I honestly think that it is. Let's keep going. He goes on to say that despite the 2.5 million jobs gained in May, he feels that there are millions of people who work in parts of the economy that will be slower to recover. He said some of the jobs that have popped up, like grocery delivery, will ultimately be desirable. There are many other jobs that need to wait until the medical situation has improved. And because of this, he wants unemployment benefits extended. I totally get this. Customer confidence is a big driver for a lot of different companies. I mean, Disney, as an example, is a company that's going to be heavily driven by customer confidence. Nobody wants to go to a theme park unless they feel safe and that they're going to enjoy themselves. Cruise lines are also another company that depend heavily on customer confidence. So this is a reasonable argument. He goes on to talk about what I said before, the extra $600 a week that people are receiving in unemployment benefits ends on July 31st. And that as that benefit stops, then so will the spending. A lot of people will need to cut their spending, and that will ultimately depress the economy. There were two senators, Michael Bennett and Jack Reed, that said they should extend the benefits based on the situation in specific states. He said they should consider things like the local health situation and the unemployment rate. They said Congress might ultimately go a different direction, but having local conditions affect the plan would be better than an arbitrary end date. Jerome Powell's next point was that more businesses need money. He's basically talking about the potential for permanent effects to the economy here. He's saying that if small businesses cannot stay solvent, that it could potentially cripple the U.S. economy for years. And ultimately, that could be disastrous for the economy. It says here that the payment protection plan was only designed to last two and a half months, which isn't really enough, especially given the recent trajectory of the virus. 
Then it says there are a couple of congressmen that are proposing expanding the PPP and that it would be helpful. Next, it talks about how state and local governments are currently getting squeezed by the lower tax environment. Obviously, since nobody's working, they're not receiving nearly as much money in taxes, while they are also shelling out money in the same way that they were before. This graph shows that from 2009 to 2011, state and local governments received decreased tax revenue during the last Great Recession, and this made it much more difficult for state and local governments to function. Which brings him to his last point. If Congress does not act and support these state and local governments, they'll continue to have to shed jobs. And it shows that local governments have already shed 1.3 million jobs since February, with state governments losing another 300,000. So it's not nothing. There's definitely a lot of jobs being lost. And if Congress doesn't act, there is potential for more losses. But again, we have to balance this out with the fact that every dollar that Congress is spending is debt because Congress is also experiencing the same tax losses. To solve this problem, there is currently a bill that passed the House of Representatives called the HEROES Act, which would give $500 billion to state and local governments. But I've talked about this before. There's too many things in that bill that will not pass the Senate, and it's pretty much dead on arrival. Next up, the Wild Wild West. This article is basically saying that a bunch of 20 to 30-year-olds who just got a bunch of stimulus checks are taking that money and investing in the stock market. And because of that, it's driving up equity prices, and that's causing seasoned investors to have to chase them as the market rallies higher. I don't know if this article has aged well since the market is currently down and futures are down a little bit further this morning, but it's an interesting idea. Let's see what else they have to say. It says here that there's a lot of FOMO going on, which is causing people to chase the market upwards. And since there are zero commission brokers, there's a lot of young investors that are using platforms like Robinhood to basically pass the time during their cough situation lockdowns. Jim Cramer from Mad Money says we have to suffer as the get rich quick crowd gets blown out. And basically they're using the fact that you can get onto your phone and start up a brokerage account very quickly and without a lot of money. And that's causing a lot of people to invest more in the market, which essentially is driving up prices. It says here they're being called the retail bros and they historically make up a very small amount of traders. And it says here that Barclays does not believe that retail investors are behind the big market moves and that the purchases on the Robinhood platform tend to underperform the market. This is kind of what I was saying before. Retail investors really only make up about 20% of the overall market. 80% is still sitting in these large hedge funds. Basically, the smart money is what's pushing the market around. It says here, but even if retail investors are not to blame for the market moves, you can hardly blame them for jumping into the market when you see the Fed ballooning their balance sheet from $4 trillion to $7.2 trillion with estimates of up to $10 trillion by the end of this cough situation. When the Fed's willing to pump money into the system, you're basically riding the wave of the stock market. Another big driver here is that treasury bonds are offering less than 1% yield. And cash obviously offers 0% yield. Where else is there to go with your money? On top of that, there's been a fantastic rebound in the markets since the 2008-2009 crisis. And as a result of all of that, you have companies like Hertz going up 37%, even though they had just filed for bankruptcy. All right, let's talk Disneyland reopening. So it says here that Disney is going to reopen on 17 July as well as their shopping centers are going to reopen on the 9th of July and the 23rd of July. They're going to open their parks in accordance with government social distancing and that they will require annual pass holders to make reservations in advance. So basically what I'm getting out of this is you can go to Disneyland and nobody's going to be there if you're lucky enough to get in. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. It goes on to say that many people have lost loved ones due to the cough situation. A solution to this would be don't go to Disneyland. For those of us who might want to go to Disneyland and take a little bit of risk, here's your opportunity. Then it goes on to go through a couple of different tweets of people complaining about Disneyland reopening. One of these tweets was Perez Hilton, the arbiter of health and safety, urging people to not go to Six Flags or Disneyland says here that people don't believe that Disney is going to change their plans and that they think that Disney did a lot of market research in order to verify that this was the right course of action for them. It then says that the only thing stopping a reopening would be a dramatic escalation in the amount of cases. Otherwise, Disney is going to open. 
Disney Shanghai opened back in May, as well as Walt Disney World in Florida. It says here that they did institute a few temporary policies to help ensure some health and safety. They're going to do temperature checks, require face masks, also eliminate experiences like parades and meet and greets. So just to recap, Jay Powell is confident in the economy as long as Congress takes some steps to reinforce it. Retail traders have not taken over the stock market, but their activity is increasing. And Disney is going to reopen amid all of the risks. If you enjoyed this video and found it informative, definitely like and subscribe. Comment down below if you would feel comfortable going to Disney World right now. And with that, let's get to the jelly. So today's jelly is the Antonoff 225 or AN225. It is the heaviest aircraft in the world. And let's see what this thing looks like taking off, if it even can. Here you can see the absolutely massive plane next to a pickup truck, just for size reference. This is a great shot of the overall wingspan. Again, clearly massive. Looks like it's got at least seven sets of tires there in the back. Again, a great side shot, so you can really visualize the length of it. And now it looks like it can barely make it up that hill. Just a slight incline. Take a look at that wingspan from the back, plus that massive tail structure.